Uh, let's move on now to council initiated discussion. Uh, I think you've all been through this experience before. This is where we basically turn the microphone over to you. We ask for uh, suggestions of reports that you would like to hear at future council meetings. These can be reports from other institute directors, like we heard earlier this morning from or this afternoon from Dr. Wojcik, or it could be reports on certain of our research programs. Uh, we also regard you as representatives of the scientific community. And if you're aware of problems or troubles that are out there brewing in the extramural, extramural world, we would be happy to hear about those or any other concerns that you have. So what are your thoughts? I'd also point out that we do keep a list of things we've heard previously. In some cases, we've decided to the timing might not be exactly right, and we maybe sort of aiming to schedule that in at a future council meeting. Given that nobody's saying anything, um, the one thing I'm seeing a lot of people complaining about, and we brought this up before, is the, um, the overburden from bureaucracy, uh, changing bureaucracies, like changing the biosketch, things like that. But um, we, we have a meeting already set up to discuss that further. But it, it just just sharing with you that I see it more and more people complaining about that. There are a lot there are a lot of reporting requirements in the biosketch. It has really it has been changed, and um, multiple times. Howard, go ahead. Kyle. Uh, yes, uh, I think Eric brought up the issue of inflation, and I want to kind of note that sort of the erosion of the purchasing power of uh, NIH grants in the standard modular. And so, um, one of this is time to, well, this is, a, of course, an NIH wide discussion to kind of revisit uh, those limits. Uh, specifically, what limits are you talking about, Howard? Sorry, Salary. not so much limits, but just kind of the standard sort of budget. Um, Are you asking for an increase in the modular budget above the current level? Yes. Okay. Yes, and also perhaps then the, the cap at which basically uh, sort of awardees get secondary review, for example, by council, right? Because basically that, that amount would just be a certain amount of purchasing power. It's actually much less than what it used to be. Okay. Kyle. Um, in light of the earlier presentation, it um, might be helpful. And as we're thinking about the NASM group, thinking about race, ethnicity, and ancestry, um, I, I would love to hear an update on any work about uh, changing the CMS categories and whether that's, you know, on the horizon, is, is there active work going on in that domain, just sort of updating those categories and to better reflect our um, contemporary understanding of, of race and ethnicity, and then, you know, eventually concepts like ancestry and LGBTQ status, those types of groupings. Okay. Steve Rich. Yeah, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, NHGRI is supporting lots of new approaches, either from the standpoint of technology and and moving into new areas, multi-omics, also analytics and, and methods for analyses of complicated data. And it seems that one of the limitations that comes up often is a lack of sort of scientific community support of how to actually understand what's being done uh, and what are the sources of data and how to, to work with it. It's almost community engagement and, and so, you know, in addition to expecting a lot of the projects to have community engagement as part of their, their uh, action items, I, I wonder what NHGRI is doing overall um, in terms of holding workshops or something. Um, is that where it's 
investigator initiated opportunities that then gets reviewed or is it something that in HGRI can think about, oh, this is an area of importance and we need to get people together and, and put something so it can be, you know, almost like Eric did when the strategic plan was being developed, you know, taking a show on the road and going to different places. Um, yeah. Steve, Steve, could you put a little more detail on what's the expertise we'd be bringing to a gathering like that? Yeah, I mean, you have to realize this just came to me, so it's not very, very well formed, but I was thinking, you know, for example, if there were some key people that were experts in, in analysis of multi-omics data and tools, you know, as, as Raph was, was saying, you know, we could have those people commit to maybe putting on, you know, four or five show and tells over a period of a year at different sites around the country. Uh, it, it's worked in in some ways um, in in the immunology field. They have these types, a group of people, investigators who basically hold workshops uh, in different places at different times. You know, it's. I think it's it's something that would be good for the scientific community. It'd be great for trainees to attend uh, as well as, as young investigators and you know, get an opportunity for an HGRI to get out in front. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's an interesting idea, Steve. I've, I've had similar thoughts and talking to people. Two, two things come to mind, sort of one, one in the rear view mirror. I can remember some of the earliest days when NCBI was just setting up a lot of their stuff and data was just flowing into to GenBank, you know, they would sit there at like an ASHG meeting and they'd have a booth and they would, you know, tell you, they'd sit with you and say, click there and they click there. They would do road shows all the time. Of course, now it's so much more complicated. I still think they'd go to booths and they train, but it's, you're looking for something much more complex. Mm -hmm. But I, I could, I see what you're saying. And then the second thought I have, and I don't know if anybody on my staff want to chime in further, is my understanding where there's a place where that kind of thing might start happening is especially with all of us data. I think all of us is planning some things and uh, I, you know, again, you made the point, we should lead and, and that's fine. We could do it with them in some ways, but, but I think that you're right that there are these massive data sets which we brag about that are impenetrable to some people. And could we just get the, the activation, you know, barrier down a little bit? I think Carolyn just raised her hand and maybe she's gonna make some comments about the all of us workbench. And I apologize for my backlitness. Yes, I think that the all of us workbench is definitely thinking about roadshows and then building on the discussion that Marilyn, um, Dr. Ritchie led earlier today. I also think there's, uh, there's opportunities with Anvil and some of the outreach that we're doing there, not just to introduce people to the workbenches, which I know what you're talking about, um, Steve, isn't just like, how do you get this environment, but how do you actually take on these new um, data sets and new approaches. And I think for both all of us and Anvil and other places, I think it needs to be moving past just how do you get in and get access to these places, but how do you really have meaningful use cases that demonstrate to people the types of research and the types of activities they could do in those settings and therefore to your point also with their own data. And so I think there's a really strong opportunity for us to sort of get a twofer out of some of these things we've been thinking about doing to sort of bring in what you're talking about, which is really that like, not just how do I get into these spaces, but how do I really think about all of the subtleties and important is issues, getting an introduction to that for the data. I don't know if that touches on what you were getting at, Steve, and I think it's something we could think about coming back to council or thinking of, about working with a group of council to your point about how to move some of this forward. Um, our data science working group of council would be a good place to sort of bring that into some further discussion. Yeah, that's helpful. And Steve, as you think about it more deeply, if you have other thoughts of ways to structure this, organizing it, finding it, you know, give us a, give a shout. Sure. Hal, go ahead. Yeah, I, I really like Steve's idea, but I, I wonder if um, having a traveling show would be too limiting with regard to how many people um, could be exposed. Um, has there been consideration of creating a curriculum and teaching tools for people to use locally to expose their students to these resources and how they're used? 
Well, you would, you would think there's probably bits and pieces of lots of graduate programs out there where they have that. And I, how are you suggesting that we would try to fund something that would be readily transferable? I mean, to really yeah. fund a curriculum development. Yes, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. Well, I was also wondering if Valentina or Sergio want to get on and talk a little bit about the concept that we, how this relates to the concept you presented in the in September, Sergio. Sure, Carolyn, can you hear me fine? Okay. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, Hal, uh, what we have in mind is a series of two funding announcements that were discussed at the council in September. Uh, one of those is for a cooperative agreement, uh, a hub, as we call it, an educational hub that will reach out and connect with institutions across the country, uh, many of which will be serving uh, students from underrepresented backgrounds and introduce them to the concepts of data science, uh, big data, cloud computing, sort of doing some foundational activity in helping students and faculty across the country getting ready for genomic data science in a cloud environment. And then shortly after that, we have a second funding announcement lined up, which is an R25, which will be for faculty members at these institutions to actually apply to create educational content, uh, classroom courses, online labs, cloud-based uh, analysis labs, where their students would learn how to use the cloud and how to do genomic analysis on the cloud. And together, you know, the hub and the sites, the, those other funding, the, the smaller institutions would work with the hub. And we envision that becoming the start of a wonderful network of institutions that will be educational, uh, you know, powerhouses for teaching the students of the future how to do data science and genomics in the cloud. This is specifically geared for institutions that um, are uh, catering to underrepresented um, minority populations, or this would be generalizable to any, for example, graduate program. The hub uh, hell is uh, or Dr. Dates is not so much uh, targeted to minority students. That we we hope that lots of students and faculty from minority serving institutions will engage. But the hub does have a broad mandate, and uh, I'm I'm sort of uh, looking at the hub as being a place that will create resources that could be used by institutions across the board. The sites, the second funding announcement that I mentioned, is uh, at least planned to be something where minority-serving institutions would be the preferred applicants. And Hal, the point you're making, I think the point you're implying, which is probably correct, is that if if we can make this sort of not require people getting on airplanes flying somewhere, it levels the playing field, makes it more widely available, more likely to not have disparities. And so what should probably be emphasized is readily disseminatable electronically through Zoom, through virtual things, as opposed to roadshow. So maybe we need an internet roadshow is what you should call it, as opposed to a, a true roadshow, because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be great for us to set up a roadshow, go to Hopkins and, Stanford and UVA. I mean, that, that's not what's, you know, it'd be nice to have those folks get access to whatever we develop, but it'd be better if everybody got access. So I, I think I hear the points being made. And I don't, I think in today's world, you don't need, you don't need the physical roadshows, you just need the virtual ones. Mm -hmm. Carolyn? Yeah, and I think I just would add to that, recognizing we're sort of in this advent, advantage advantageous situation of being an open council and people can reach out to me. If you Google Carolyn Hutter, you'll find my email right away and I'll connect to the right people. I'm not actually the right person for this. To think about the partnerships and the other places that we can work with. We have internally, you know, some of my colleagues have been talking about, we have, for example, our recent technology development coordinating center, which is having some opportunities for outreach and extending. The SEGS programs often have out, um, opportunities to think about outreach and to think about how we're sort of leveraging and collecting some of that information. But also, you know, ASHG is an example of a partnership organization that we could do some of these things with. If people have ideas of other groups we should be working with, or Steve, Rich, to your first point of, you know, should we be convening some more discussion in this area? I'm happy to sort of start collecting who would be other sort of partnerships and groups for us to work with and thinking about how to do this. And because I, I, you know, the roadship isn't, roadshow isn't just limited by where we're able to go, but it's limited by the, the, the um, 
time availability of how many things you have. And so thinking about how to do some of these things in ways that you and Hal are talking about that sort of allow them to sort of grow and disseminate even more would I think be really useful to be thinking about. Steve again? Steve, yeah, so, uh, go ahead. So, so I think the virtual roadshow makes a lot of sense. The, the other point is, is also that it can't be a static uh, roadshow. I mean, things change, things are always evolving. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's a type of thing where you want to have it living and changing and adapting. So it, the virtual aspect makes a lot more sense that way. Yeah, and Steve, maybe your point, which I, I think is a good one, is it would be a silly exercise, and I'm just making this up, but it would be a silly exercise for NHGRI to fund the development of a curriculum on a, on a three-year grant and then end it and just assume it's going to have a shelf life. I mean, yeah, if yeah. you don't continue, if you're going to commit to it, you got to commit to it, especially in this area. Yeah. Of, of work, you'd have to commit to constantly um, updating it. And so it, it would require ongoing, at least some amount of, low, low, uh, some amount of funding. Yeah. I get it. Wouldn't that most logically be done through the anvil? Uh, well, others, others could answer. I mean, that's one, one, that's certainly one place we could logically do it. it, it that would may end up being anvil centric. Um, so, and, and I think, uh, we shouldn't, we probably want to promote our brand, but I don't think we want to make an exclusive uh, a point of developing curriculum around our, our resource. There's a lot of other resources out there that are, we probably want to make sure get connected, but. Okay, if to car. Yeah, I wanted to say, I want to um, voice my support of this. I think the timing is really great. Um, I think the the impact could be really broad. And the reason is uh, because of cloud computing and the resources already you know, spent for creating and will, um, a lot of MDs are, may not be comfortable with scripting and programming, but with the built-in tools in cloud computing, it's suddenly become very accessible for them to actually tackle big data. And uh, you know, that you could imagine that there's a research fellow or an intern who has six months or a year of research and they can potentially be very productive um, by, you know, knowing about Anvil and the resources and the access to data sets and, uh, you know, really deliver some um, good, good uh, research and, and uh, results. And I think this is a really exciting time because you, these tools make it accessible for people who are not sophisticated at programming to actually start working with big data and not, not be afraid uh, uh, or intimidated by it. So I think Anvil is a good starting point. And then creating a curriculum where you teach people how to access the data and use the tools, the Docker containers, Galaxy, and all that stuff to really do all, a lot of exciting uh, work. Peter. Um, there's been so much praise, I, I feel the need to be a little contrarian. In general, I support this, I think it's a great idea, but um, I, I think we have to be really careful about exactly how this is done, and I'm worried about it being underfunded. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, there's, a, there's just a ton of stuff available on Google and Coursera. I'm a, I'm a consumer of a lot of that myself. Um, second, I'm, I'm also thinking of another NIH resource, uh, the, the Palantir platform. So I'm involved in this N3C study and that's got a ton of documentation, but it's actually, uh, a lot of it is not up to date <laughs> and, and they, they just don't have the resources to keep it up to date. And, and so the platform changes and, and, the, and the documentation is no longer correct. And, and I mean, I just wouldn't underestimate the effort needed to, um, actually do this, um, I, I still struggle a little bit to see what is the connection to underrepresented minorities because it, it's hard for me to believe that the documentation should be different for different population backgrounds. Um, and, and so I'm, I, I just get the feeling that this, the, the, the intention is great, but I'm, I'm not actually entirely convinced by the implementation yet. Sure, Joe, did you want to comment? 
Um, yes, sir, if I may briefly. So Dr. Robinson, that is actually excellent feedback. The, the part of this that we are trying to do across the board is foundational learning in data science and genomics. And uh, this is of course happening at a time where not just, just the Genome Institute, but for example, the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy and the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. So we are looking to build content which should be usable by all students at the undergraduate and master's levels. And in that sense, we have, at least at this point, we have people or other NIH entities lined up where we hope to have enough funding for that documentation to be kept up to date as cloud computing evolves. And the other piece of this is, this is not being approached as an anvil only exercise. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Kulo, you and others mentioned that, uh, you know, a cloud approach here can only be as powerful as uh, something that is a partnership of NIH clouds. So we are connecting with uh, all of us. We are connecting with the Biodata Catalyst and hopefully the educational activity that will come out of this is not just Anvil specific, but is trans NIH from a cloud computing perspective. But you make an excellent point about keeping things up to date. And I completely agree that that will take active, dedicated uh, personnel to make sure that these materials stay up to date with what's happening. So we'll, we'll focus on that. Al, another comment? Yeah, I mean, um, one mechanism to keep things fresh, um, you know, uh, updated and um, adequately funded is to view this as a partnership with, you know, local uh, universities. Um, if, if what we are doing is providing the tools to empower local teachers to provide their students a better experience, um, you know, I, I think we're more likely to uh, achieve the goals of staying fresh and uh, and um, you know uh, providing adequate funding. Um, so you know I'm thinking of case studies or um, you know very carefully designed practical experiences um, that local uh, professors or uh, teachers can use um, to share with students, but not necessarily the institute taking full responsibility for. Uh, you know, fully fleshed out um, teaching experience. Can anyone on council think of an example of another area of biomedical research or technology or science where sometime over the last 20 years that was in a similar inflection point and there was a successful intervention by NIH to develop whatever was needed. I mean, I'm just looking for a case study that we could go back and see how it was funded or we could see how it was organized. We could see what partnerships were developed. I, I'm just racking my brain. I, I, I can't think of one, but I wonder if there were examples of some new technology or some new clinical area or something. Okay, everybody has the same look that I feel I have in my head. I just I feel like I'm missing something. It would just be so good to have a precedent. Laura? Well, we just had the all of us do a road show at WashU in St. Louis, and they really have a very nice road show where they, you know, uh, did small groups, did a variety of things. So it's it's in the same topic, but yeah, yeah. they're they're really quite good. Okay, I mean, I'm aware of. I, I mean, I'm aware of what they're doing. I, I was I was just trying to think of more what like Hal was saying, like massive course development, case studies, and. Just wondering, you know, what predated genomics in this kind of realm that we could. I'm just trying to figure out what other institutes might have done when their area was at a hot inflection point. Peter, short comment, but um, I I find the the workshops that are given at meetings such as ASHG. I mean, it's a roadshow. I know that limits the ability of, of certain people to to attend it, but I find them very good because they're they're guaranteed to be up to date. You have contact with the people. Yeah. You know, and I don't need a, a long curriculum to get to know how to learn to use some some platform. I just need these are the important things, and then I explore it. And so I think that's very. And I'd, I'd like to see NIH sort of support more of that that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's an effective way of educating people. And we do have. I mean, Eric, we do have some experience with this. I think of the Encode group, for example, has had a number of those types of ASHG activities yeah. and and user focused meetings and other things that have really brought the sort of use of that 
Yeah, yeah, um, no, I, I think the Jamboree Roadshow, we call it whatever we want, publicly, all that, I was, I was really honing in on Hal's point about truly developing a curriculum or developing, say, working hand in glove with an academician who has a graduate program and about, and I was just, I'm just trying to imagine, does NIH do this very often? How do they fund it? What are examples? What worked, what didn't work? So I was just looking for that. I agree with you and what Peter just said. No question, we should continue to take all those opportunities. But if we were gonna actually really try to build something a little deeper and wider curriculum wise. All right. Well, that was a fruitful uh, discussion. Okay. I'm going to draw us to close unless people want to change the subject. So I, I'm just noticing that NIH, um, the Institute of General Medical Sciences, has a web page called Curriculum Supplements um, that has a lot of things to um, explore. So okay. maybe maybe that could provide some examples. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. Out of all the institutes, I would have thought GMS might have been a likely one for that kind of thing. We will find out. We'll have somebody talk to somebody. Thanks, Al. Sure.